morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Surjit Singh, and I would be chairing this session. Uh, the first talk uh, of this session will be by uh, Philip Mendels, and he will be talking about spectroscopies of quantum materials. Uh, no, you... quantum, the title is Kagome Quantum Spin Liquids. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the, the title is uh, on Herbert Smith. Smith. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you. So uh, I think you can hear me. Okay. So I'm uh, 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 thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to come to India and meet uh, my colleagues here in person. And uh, okay, just to make it clear, I'm going to talk about Herbert Smith site, which is one of the famous uh, Kagome quantum Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And I am a member, well, I'm the team leader still for a few, uh, few weeks, and then Fabrice Belt will uh, take the lead of this group, which is spectroscopies of quantum materials at uh, Paris-Saclay University. Okay, I cannot resist to, to show this. Uh, this is some uh, small out outreach uh, videos which have been made by uh, our colleague, uh, Julien Bobroff. He was a member of the group uh, working a lot on high TCQ rates and uh, nick ties and then he decided to go to outreach so he has a very nice uh, website and then uh, is, this is just to illustrate two key features of this uh, kagome heisenberg antiferromagnet macroscopic entanglement uh, as you can see on uh, the right on the left side and then the deconfined fractionalized spin excitations so this is a small small movie uh, that you can uh, download if you like Okay, so these are key features, this macroscopic entanglement, the confined pressure and the spring excitations that we are looking for on this Kagome Heisenberg antiferromagnets. And the uh, uh, big thing is that uh, the field had kept silent for uh, years and years uh, since uh, the beginning of this story, the 90s, until uh, this compound, the Herbert Smith site, uh, was discovered. And uh, uh, why is it so, so interesting is that uh, the Kagome planes are uh, really uh, perfect. You have equilateral triangles where, uh, where cappers, spin one half, capper two plus, are coupled through OH bridge here. And ideally, they would be separated by zinc two plus areas, which are uh, non magnetic. So we did uh, early on some uh, mu SR, and you can vary the zinc to copper content, start, start by the copper four compound and uh, uh, investigate it up to the pure, what, would be, what was supposed to be the pure at that time. And uh, uh, what, uh, what you have is that, uh, um, uh, okay, the interaction, sorry. Uh, interactions, you know, the dominant interaction is the in-plane interactions, and all the, interaction, all the other interactions are much, much smaller. So. Um, one of the interactions which is missing here is uh, one which uh, would be between a copper interlayer to the copper layer. Okay, I will come back to this later. Um, so there are many uh, then uh, other compounds, you know, which are derived from this Herbert Smith site, from this first uh, compound, and Quang Choi uh, uh, spent some time presenting them, you know, and uh, there are various variants. So you change the anion, the OH, and you put F bromine, fluorine, this is Barlow White, and then you can go to brocantite, and many compounds, which are the sister compounds. And each of them has its own properties, okay? Uh, my talk is uh, dedicated to Herbert Smith site. You heard a lot about uh, Barlow White by uh, Takashi Mai and, uh, uh, and many others. Okay, so uh, just to come back to that slide, um, the main problem here uh, as uh, uh, pointed out already by Takashi Mai, is that uh, you have a substantial substitution of copper 2 plus on the zinc side. So it's of the order of 15% for Herbert Smith side, and uh, presumably uh, less for Barlow White, although uh, there, it has been less studied up to now, so uh, one has to, to be still a bit careful about that. So Herbert Smith site is sitting here, right? And uh, this is uh, the results from the MUSR experiments, where you see that when you increase the zinc content, then you reach uh, a broad range of concentrations where you have no spin freezing at all, down to a very low temperature, down to 20 millik. So this is uh, uh, where the quantum spin liquid phase sets, and with this uh, typical content of uh, 
copper uh, to zinc site uh, for Herbert Smith site. Okay, um, so uh, what I will uh, speak about is uh, mainly uh, uh, NMR, and uh, uh, we have been using uh, uh, one nucleus, which is the oxygen, which is in the bridge between uh, uh, coppers, uh, Kagome coppers. So it's very strongly coupled to the physics of the Kagome layers and much less coupled to the copper on the, on the zinc side. Um, as compared to other nuclei, um, uh, this was uh, over there, sorry. Oops. Yes. So uh, there, there are uh, many nuclei that you can use in NMR, chlorine, uh, uh, protons, the, or deuterium, and uh, they are dominantly coupled to the copper at the zinc site. Okay, so uh, even the muon, when uh, you implant it and you try to do shift measurements, is also very, very strongly coupled to these coppers. Okay, so uh, these were the very first results on uh, powders, and uh, what you can do with NMR is make uh, shift measurements. You had this tutorial by uh, my colleague uh, Fabrice Bert, and uh, Takashi and I also spent some time re-explaining NMR, so I'm not going to enter the details. So by measuring the shift of your line, um, uh, yeah, you know, it's a spectroscopic measurement. You make a splitting of the Zeeman, nuclear Zeeman levels, and you have a frequency, a resonance frequency, and this resonance frequency depends on the local field. And the local field is related to the susceptibility in a local way, so that uh, as it's a spectroscopic technique, you can reveal different sites, you know, by their different shifts in NMR. And uh, with this, you can uh, re reveal uh, that there are some defects, which is not a su surprise because of this coppers to the zinc site, and uh, also try to discriminate this defect contribution from the intrinsic contribution from the Kagome planes. And with T1, you heard a lot about T1, uh, you can uh, uh, investigate the dynamics. And again, you can uh, investigate it since it's a spectroscopic technique, you can reveal the defect part, what is associated to the defect part, and to uh, the other part, the main part, which uh, we, call, we call intrinsic. Okay, um, so uh, early on, you know, this is a macroscopic susceptibility measurement, so you have a huge uh, uh, Curie tail here, and this is a strictly Curie without any vice temperature uh, above 1K, which is very, very small as compared to J, which is of the order of 200K. And what we found with uh, just uh, NMR on powders using uh, oxygen 70 is that uh, the shift is, uh, is going down here. I will detail that a little bit later. So it tells you that there is something already go coming, coming in and likely because of these coppers as a zinc site. Okay, so what can we do with NMR? Do our best to discriminate what is what, uh, which is which. So uh, this is just uh, uh, the people who have been participating to the work I present today. And I would like to emphasize the contribution from Panchan and Kuntia, who was postdoc in our group, and uh, Quentin Barthélemy, a former uh, student who is now in Sherbrooke, Fabrice Bert, you saw him, and Edwin Kermarek, who is the other member. And the crystals on which we have been working are, are made by uh, Matthias Velasquez, who was formerly at TCMCB and now is in Grenoble. And uh, I will present also some uh, high field specific heat measurements uh, done with the uh, three uh, guys. And uh, uh, it's not so easy to do high field specific heat measurements, they are really specialists, and uh, up to uh, 30 Teslas in Grenoble. And uh, we, are, we have a very strong support on the theory side by Bernard Bernu and Laura Messio, uh, who do series expansion and try to fit the data with that. Okay, um, so. Uh, just to come back um, to, uh, to the NMR, so uh, um, oxygen 17 uh, is a spin five halves, so you expect five lines. And if you look at the spectrum, even at room temperature, just very high, you know, and you write, uh, you, you, right away you see that you have more lines, right? And actually there are two spectra, two spectra of five lines, one which is uh, the main, main contribution, which is here and the other one, which is with these asterisks, and the other lines, there are only three, but they are behind uh, these main peaks here. Okay, and uh, uh, so you have at least two sites, right? Uh, two sites in NMR, which tells you that you have two different environments. 
So one, one is a, what I would call the perfect environment for oxygen. You have a zinc here and three copper in the kagome layer, so that's fine. And this is a dominant uh, contribution. And the other one, and then you have two possibilities. This possibility with the copper uh, interlayer, uh, which will give a different environment for uh, the oxygen and for the physics of the kagome planes. And the other one, which could be a zinc, uh, you know, substituted uh, into the Kagome planes that we were arguing for. And actually, uh, uh, it, uh, it has been proven that uh, it's not the case from a very nice, uh, you know, uh, structural refinements and uh, uh, absorption uh, X-ray spectroscopy. And uh, uh, it's claimed that it's less than 1%. So uh, I will discard completely this scenario. So now we agree to discard this scenario, although we were claiming that it was important in the beginning. OK. Um, just to come back, uh, uh, there was yesterday compound that uh, uh, Concho pre presented. And uh, there was a lot of disorder of interactions and uh, uh, distribution of uh, Js. And actually, uh, because the uh, lines are fairly narrow at 300K, um, and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, the J coupling is coming from the oxygens, and, uh, uh, you know, we have a hyperfine coupling in an MR of these oxygens, and there are, you could say uh, roughly that they are scaling with each other. So if you would have a distribution of J, you would have a distribution of this hyperfine coupling. So it would broaden the lines. The lines are so narrow that you can put an upper bound to this delta J over J, and which is uh, much smaller than the 40% needed to stabilize a quantum spin liquid induced by disorder. So you can discard completely this scenario. So now, um, uh, if I make a, you know, a jump in the history of this compound, which has been around since uh, 2006, um, I'm a bit bothered, I must say, because uh, if you look at the titles of the papers, you know, uh, our papers included, and those uh, from uh, Takashi Imai, um, there was one in 2015, evidence for a gap, then we claimed gapless ground state, and then evidence of spin singlets with uh, inhomogeneous gaps. So people say we don't understand anything out of NMR. We don't see uh, whether it's gapped or gapless. So actually, uh, what I would like to do in this talk, and uh, I will spend a bit of time, my time to that, is to show you that the, the NMR gives consistent pictures. And it's just in the interpretation at this stage that there are differences. So what, you have to read papers completely, not, not just read the titles. OK, okay um, let's go on uh, to our uh, results. So. Um, it was very nice to have this uh, in my paper. They gave a lot of technical uh, uh, insights, you know, and we used one of, of his on this Oxygen 17 NMR. They were a little bit before us publishing, which is always bothering when you want to publish after. And uh, okay, we apply a field along A star, which uh, brings uh, the five lines for one site to a single line, okay, at high temperatures. This is what we have here. And then we observe, uh, uh, evolution of the spectra when you decrease the temperature. And obviously, you know, if, if you are not an NMR expert, you see uh, that uh, you, go, you go from a simple line to something where you have these uh, singularities appearing here. So you have a broadening, and which is due to this uh, disorder, let's say, and uh, you have special lines here. And uh, NMR, uh, you can play like uh, you would do with uh, 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 medical resonance imaging, you can have contrast sequence. I'm not going to enter the details, but uh, by uh, doing uh, what you would call T2 contrast, just uh, applying uh, pulse sequence with a long time between the pulses, we were able to single out one very clear spectrum with very narrow lines as compared to uh, the main line. So that's one thing. So this is what we call T2 contrast. We isolated some specific lines. And the other one is you can kill this contribution by uh, what we call T1 contrast. So you, this guy has a long relaxation time. So you can kill it by a T1 sequence adapted to this. And uh, then you, you isolate what I call the main line. And you can follow it uh, 
in temperature. Of course, it's very broad, and it's very risky to point, you know, at the um, uh, variation of the shift with temperature. Okay, so there was some, uh, you know, between the two first papers, so that for me, my, uh, from ours, there was a, a small dispute about this, and uh, uh, we felt that we had done a little bit better. And that's how we claimed that it was gapless. Okay, um, what is important now in the, in the current situation is that uh, uh, we can uh, do, uh, you know, some integration of the spectra and measure the weight. And uh, there are many corrections in, in NMR. Uh, you don't like to measure the number of sites in NMR. It's a spectroscopic technique, very nice, but measuring uh, uh, the number of sites is a bit complicated. And what I call the uh, resolved lines, which I uh, uh, anticipate that it's due to defect, but that can be uh, discussed later. It's 45% from uh, uh, the T2 contrast. And uh, another way is uh, to uh, try to subtract the spectrum from the main spectrum and to smooth it out. And uh, with this, we find 40, about 40% 40 weight for this uh, defect line. Okay, uh, another feature is that if you look at uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, spectrum with narrower peaks is only resolved below 30K. And uh, it seems to be a very special temperature in uh, uh, the physics of Herbert Smith site. Is that where the spin liquid starts, you know, to correlate or something like that? And, and uh, uh, this is a question, is it typical of spin liquid state? We feel so. And uh, Takashi Maya has also data from his NQR showing that something is happening below 30K. So it's a new temperature scale. So, um, the, you know, to try uh, to answer the question, uh, is there a gap or not, uh, uh, the best is to do uh, uh, dynamics measurement, so T1 measurements. And the advantage of applying a field is that we have spectra, we have the Zeeman spectra, and we can uh, try, you know, to uh, see on different uh, places, uh, different locations of the spectra, what is T1. And this is what uh, Takashi and I, you know, we converge. Huh? He, he's calling that uh, 2D correlation, where he tried, well, he, he took T1 uh, uh, at different uh, positions of the shift, so pos different position of the spectrum. So um, the idea, our idea was, uh, let's look here. Why? Because this defect line, uh, you know, is uh, quasi zero at this position. So we felt that we have the intrinsic physics here. So we measured that. We measured T1. So this is a relaxation curves. We fitted them with a simple exponential. I do insist there is no stretch exponential. And uh, this uh, uh, fit works very well. You know, uh, just uh, uh, there is no change of shape of the relaxation. And uh, uh, we can also uh, try to probe here where you have a mixture or here where you have a domin uh, where this contribution from the defect is dominant. And what you see is that uh, T1 is longer. There is a longer relaxation time here for the gray one for this. And uh, this one is an average at the top of the line here. So here we already see, so this is a log scale. So you see you have, you have uh, relaxation times which are 10 times longer for this, for this spectrum here. And we can play with the weight as well. Uh, how much weight do we need uh, between the red and green and gray to get, to get green? And uh, again, we find about 40%. Okay, so this number 40% to 60% seems to be quite uh, reliable. And uh, from uh, Takashima, you heard about uh, also this, the same numbers, okay. Uh, 50, 50, 40, 60, 60, 40. Okay. It has been varying from his paper to, to his talk, actually. So, but uh, this, is a, uh, this is a typical one. So once you have done that, uh, you can plot T1, and uh, you see uh, 1 over T1 is not gapped at all. And that's how we claim it's a gapless you know, scenario from this part of, of the spectrum. And uh, 1 over T1 is quasi-linear in, in temperature. If you would uh, like to put a gap, it, it would be much much smaller that uh, uh, there is no spin gap behavior, but, but because we apply a field, you have to be conservative and say it's much less than uh, 1 over 50 J, uh, which is in no model uh, 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 a gap, which is uh, uh, as small. 
uh, for a gap scenario. Um, uh, okay, so that I already said, defect 10 times lower expectation. So to compare to uh, uh, the NQR uh, data presented by Imai, he didn't, uh, he, he focused most on Barlow White. I, I visualized his talk and, uh, yesterday. And uh, he focused more on Barlow White, but had some uh, insights also in Herbert Smith's site, which are much more developed in the, in the, in the paper. And uh, doing, by doing NQR, uh, you know, uh, he was uh, saying that there are two relaxation modes. By doing NQR, you don't apply any field, so you lose a spectroscopic, you know, a spe a spectroscopic insight that we have. And uh, I, uh, I checked that uh, they are detecting all the cappers because cappers are relaxing very fast. And uh, yes, there's always a danger that you don't see all the cappers if you have very fast dynamics. And uh, by ca calibration to another sample, I find that the number of cappers is uh, more than 60% of the total number of cappers, so which, uh, uh, which validates the fact that they really see also the Kagome cappers. Okay, so uh, uh, what they were uh, seeing is a, a long component of uh, uh, T1, uh, one, 1 over T1 uh, is, uh, uh, is small, so slowly relaxing sites, and uh, they were uh, quoting the fraction, fraction of singlets, which seemed, so you see this is a temperature of 30K again, this typical temperatures that they have, so we agree about that. And uh, what, what, uh, what they have, they seem to have a diverging uh, contribution, which would push the claim that, okay, Kagome uh, goes towards a singlet scenario, and with a distribution of gaps. But you have to be very careful, and this is in their supplementary material, they are losing intensity also at low temperatures. So if you multiply the intensity by the, this fraction, then you have the real fraction of singlets which is detected. And what you find is this uh, green points here, green dots, and it levels off at 40%. Again, this 40% for this uh, slowly relaxing sites. Okay. So uh, it seems that we agree on that, right? Uh, we have slowly relaxing sites for about 40%, fast relaxing sites about 60%. And then the, the game is uh, which is which, right? Okay, um, one thing that we can do also, so I have, okay. Um, you know, we have very broad spectra. And uh, what I've been doing is scaling. You know, you divide by the weights and then you shift the spectra until you have them coinciding. So it gives you a very good relative accuracy on the shift. Whereas you have a broad line, uh, you, can, you can have a very good relative accuracy on the shift. And this is what we did. And uh, actually we could plot the shift here with uh, minimal error bars. And the only thing we had to, uh, to see is uh, where is the zero, you know, where is the reference. Okay, I'm not going to enter the details. This, is a, this was a semi-log plot of the shift versus temperature. So this is a susceptibility in Herbert Smith site, in what is uh, the dominant site, the main site. And if you plot it in a linear scale, it's more or less linear. And uh, it, again, from susceptibility, it seems that there is no gap for this contribution, okay, obviously. Uh, we made some uh, analysis using series expansion, and it was quite rewarding in the fact that you can uh, simulate the Kagome susceptibility, uh, you know, in all the temperature range, provided you make an assumption uh, for the specific heat, either being gapped or T gap doesn't work, or T linear in T or linear or quadratic in T. And both scenarios are compatible with our uh, data. With a, Small advantage to this to this one, but uh, very small. Okay. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, all of us are influenced by uh, uh, the way theory goes, right? At some point, uh, it was claimed very firmly that uh, it was gapped. Yeah, from uh, you know DMRG, uh, very very nice you know studies uh, from Steve White and collaborators. But then soon after, it was uh, discovered that if you take a Dirac spin liquid and you simulate with these, uh, you know, cylinders here, which were used for the DMRG, then you would find a gap. So there was a problem with this and it was corrected. And now uh, the scenario to make it short is that uh, the scenario for Dirac spin liquid is really favored. 
Of course, there are many other papers, uh, including uh, our, one of those, uh, one of our organizers, uh, Yassir, here, and uh, claiming that uh, it could be a Dirac spin liquid, a gapless spin liquid. So uh, this is elementary calculations. We wanted to compare, you know, our shift data to this uh, Dirac spin liquid scenario, and uh, then this is. Uh, actually an exam that I gave to my master's students, so any student can, uh, you know, write it down, you have to think about it. When you are at zero temperature and you apply a field, then you are going to split the two, two bands of spins, spin up and spin down, and you can calculate what would be the specific it is in R and T, and 1 over T1 that you don't calculate so easily would be algebraic in T, whereas uh, if you are uh, in a scenario where uh, KT is much larger than the field you apply, then you come back to your, your usual uh, Fermi liquid uh, story, except that you have a cone dispersion here, and your specific heat would be in T squared. In T squared. So we use this. Uh, you can calculate everything, mixing uh, field and temperature, and uh, what is predicted is this variation here, a small variation with the field you apply, and then we compare to our data, and you see uh, the gray uh, part here is a simulation, and you see this is consistent with our data. Okay, so we were temp okay, uh, it fits with the Dirac uh, spin liquid scenario. And more than that, uh, uh, it can be calculated in, in, in this Dirac spin liquid scenario. You can see uh, that uh, the susceptibility is linear in T with no adjustable parameter. And we found that indeed the slope that we had in our story was really consistent within a factor of 1.2 with, uh, with this scenario. So uh, we underlined that uh, uh, it's consistent with the U1 uh, Dirac spin liquid, but it's unstable, this scenario, as soon as you have Dialoshinsky Moria. And with Andre, we, we found uh, out that there is a, quite a sizable Dialoshinsky Moria uh, interaction, about 0.05j. Uh, which is not enough to kill the spin liquid, but which is there. So already uh, there is a small doubt about this. And uh, 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 we, uh, I'm going now to present to you uh, some specific measurements that we have. And uh, uh, the problem is that, you know, I mentioned this uh, uh, Curie tail at low temperatures. And it's responsible, this Curie tail, you know, it's quasi-free couple two plus spins. And uh, uh, this Curie tail, you know, is also responsible for a short key anomaly. So, uh, you know, your specific heat is that of the Kagome plane of the impurity, you, let's call it this copper two plus on the zinc side, and the uh, phononic, and uh, you see this bump is shifting in, in field, and uh, this is uh, uh, what you have when you simulate these short key anomalies, which correspond to the data. That was very, very early on, you know, it was analyzed this way, and we knew that it was there. So the trick is the following. Let's move. So, uh, you know, uh, the experimental data that you have with the PPMS is just up to 14 Teslas. So you still have uh, this, uh, this bump here, which bothers you to extract the category. So the idea is to push this short key anomaly very high in field by using a high field. So this is what we did, and we, you can simulate everything. And you see that the valid zone, I have to speed up a bit, the valid zone is uh, low temperatures and high fields and high fields uh, above, uh, let's say, 25 Tesla. And uh, this is uh, what we did. This is our data. And as you see, uh, this short key anomaly is still there at 10 Tesla, zero Tesla, you have it here. And then it disappears for 28 Teslas. It's at higher temperatures. So you can investigate the Kagome uh, specific it in detail. And this is, uh, these are our results. So we had two samples. One which was protonated and the other one which was deuterated for neutron experiments. And this one has a, a little bit more copper on the zinc side. So you see that uh, the specific heat is different. It's a uh, specific heat divided by T. And our results show, uh, so you can uh, uh, try to interpret them with various scenario. If you take a gap scenario, the gap would be much, much smaller than any model would predict in a gap scenario. So uh, it's, uh, if you would uh, use a spin-on uh, model, uh, you find that uh, the Fermi velocity from the, sa from the same sample as in NMR is much too small to explain the magnitude of the CP, so there is already a contradiction. And uh, 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 it fits very well with the power law, uh, which is in between one and two as an exponent. 
What is remarkable and not expected, and which goes against the Dirac spin liquid scenario, is that it's field independent between the fields uh, which we use to probe uh, uh, safely this uh, uh, specific it between 28 and 34 Teslas. That's not much, but that's enough variation. We should see something, some difference. And there is absolutely no variation with field. So uh, then we came to Bernard and uh, Laura uh, for this uh, uh, series. And uh, uh, it's very constraining, this field independence. Then. The first thing that they deduce from their series is that uh, they cannot fit the Kagome, uh, they cannot fit our specificate with a simple Kagome uh, specificate, you know, with a full plane, you know, uh, a plane which would be unaffected by anything. And they introduced an effective dilution. Uh, it's a zero order, I would say, uh, uh, input into their series, an effective dilution of the Kagome planes, which is of the order of 11 to, 30, uh, to 13 percent, depending on the sample. So that's the first thing. So you cannot say you have a perfect Kagome plane. And for that, we join with a different technique, exactly what uh, Imai was saying, and we have been saying also in our papers. And, uh, the fact that it's uh, uh, field independent constrains a lot the exponent, and uh, what they find is something which, is, uh, which agrees with uh, this uh, fit from our experimental data on high field. It's uh, t to the 1.5. So, um, sorry. Um, this is uh, uh, how it varies when uh, you introduce uh, the allusions. It's huge. You could say it's absolutely huge. But we are zooming on a very small uh, temperature scale as compared to J. And this is uh, the simulations of uh, this series, the specific it in a semi-log scale for temperature when you dilute the Kagome planes. So you see, we have been zooming here and we are very sensitive with our data, which is in very structured range to this. Okay, so uh, uh, that's it. Uh, we have uh, effective dilution. We have uh, this uh, exponent for the specific it. And actually, uh, if you uh, fit now all the data with a specific it, uh, in, uh, with uh, the specific it we found at high temperature and add a short key anomaly, you can, we can fit all our data. Okay, another problem that we have now, yes? Yeah, okay. Uh, another problem that we have now is that uh, if you take this series, the results of this series, you know, uh, and you calculate again the Kagome uh, susceptibility is very high as compared to our NMR data. So we have to improve uh, many things. So uh, the summary uh, is that uh, uh, Herbert Smith site, I like it because it has the largest amount of data available to date and a clean equilateral geometry, so we have to be very careful with that. We agree that not all excitation channels are gapped, the T1 shift specific it, uh, and uh, most of them are gapless, I would say. Uh, there is no proof that uh, there is a, gap, uh, a gapped uh, uh, component in our T1 measurements. And uh, the, T, uh, the susceptibility is very small at uh, T equals zero. There are two slow relaxing components, uh, protected against disorder and uh, uh, single out below this uh, TK. And the uh, specific it varies like T to the 1.5. So now let's discuss shortly uh, this uh, story of uh, defects. So now it's more speculative. So we know that uh, there is a copper here. So it's going to affect in a way or another uh, the, uh, the nearby coppers. And uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, it has, uh, okay, this is the reason why the sp main spectrum broadens and, uh, and why you have also, sorry, why you have also uh, these uh, singularities which appear, which are very well resolved. So uh, which is which now? Is that nearby the defect, which is 40% and 60% uh, or the other way? This is a matter of uh, discussion and which is different between Takashima and us. Although it seems that we converge if I listen to his recent talk. Okay, um, we can get some spectral information. I'm not going to enter the details, but we have two sites, actually. We have two defect sites in this result spectra. One which is not shifting, and the other one which is shifting. The D2 site has been cited by, uh, so this is the shift, so you see it's not shifting. And the other one reproduces uh, with a 
negative hyperfine constant, the uh, susceptibility which is in one over T. So I'm not going to detail this. So now uh, you have various interpretation. Uh, you, you can say, okay, we have a, uh, this copper two plus which affects the planes and then which is generating a singlet. Where is this singlet? Here, here, or is a singlet, uh, you know, uh, reflected in, in the, into the intrinsic Kagome physics. So uh, there is a crucial need, and this is my uh, nearly uh, my conclusion. There is a crucial need for understanding the nature of the de defect induced by this copper ion on the interlayer side. And the big mystery now is that we don't know this coupling. It's not known at all. So uh, in the very first uh, papers and for long, we have everyone has been claiming that uh, because we have a Curie tail, a perfect Curie tail. This coupling is zero. But you know, uh, there are many rivals to Herbert Smith's site. And uh, Barlow White, for instance, you have exactly the same QE term. So it seems a bit undecent to think that uh, J perp is going to be zero in both compounds by chance, by chance in one, but in two, which are different. No. So there is a need of uh, uh, you know, trying to understand what is this defect, calculating this J, J perp. And why it gives you an effective spin one half, uh, which is completely decoupled, which seems to be completely decoupled. So we have to come back to this uh, defect story. Instead of saying there are a couple two plus which are uncoupled and don't disturbing the Kagome planes, we are sure now that they are disturbing the Kagome planes. Okay, so um, this is it. So uh, uh, we have, uh, in conclusion, we have. Uh, uh, some sites which are not filling the long distance response, which we call near neighbor oxygen to a defect. Uh, spin texture around the defect, which has a staggered response. And uh, uh, this is why your main line is progressively broadening with alternating susceptibilities. And there is a paper by Mila Russo Chatsakis showing this. Uh, theoretically, and uh, uh, there is a quenching of the dynamics for near neighbor oxygen to a defect. Okay, so with this, uh, uh, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, the future tracks, of course, cleaner materials, uh, still looking for the ideal uh, compound. Uh, I know that there are lots of materials group in India, so maybe one, uh, one of them will synthesize the perfect Kagome. Uh, another track right now is to vary and control the defect content and see how uh, it varies and how it impacts the properties. Of course, uh, there is still a pending problem. What is the ground state of the pure model? A theoretical problem. And I insist that uh, uh, now in theoretical models, one should incorporate the defects into these uh, theoretical models. So this is a perturb to reveal strategy. And of course, need to model the interlayer defect and its impact on Kagome's pendicles. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Talk is now open for questions. Uh, thank you, Philip, for this nice talk. Uh, uh, I must say it's comforting to see that uh, your and Imai's uh, results, seem, at least from the experimental point of view, seem to uh, give you more or less the, more or less the same results. Uh, my question is, obviously, your interpretation is different. My question is, what is your uh, comment on the temperature dependence of the of the two fractions which Imai shows? Because in your picture it's structural, right? So it should be temperature independent, the relative intensity. No, uh, I, okay, maybe I was too fast on this. You know, uh, below 30K, you see progressively this uh, uh, resolved part of the spectrum. This resolution is, uh, you know, improving with temperature as well in our spectra, okay? So I didn't, uh, what I didn't do is calculate what is the weight of the spectrum uh, versus temperature. I, I calculated it at the base temperature. It's a, uh, there is a one, uh, uh, it's still uh, work to, uh, to be done. You, you have to get a much better resolution, much better spectra in order to follow them in temperature. But in your picture, you would not really expect, right? The temperature dependence, or would you? No, I think, I think it's related to the spin liquid state as well. You know, be, uh, you know uh, starting to correlate below 30K. And then uh, progressively, you know, there is a kind of crossover, you know, crossover okay. regime, I would say. And uh, uh, just uh, to come back to your comment, uh, convergence with Imai, 
I think we have looked at the same problem, uh, except for from uh, the first paper on oxygen 17 NMR, but the last paper uh, with two, two different views. One is using NQR, the other one is using us, uh, you know, we are using uh, NMR, oxygen 17 NMR. And this is converging. Okay, thank you. It's more than repeating the same experiment. It's, uh, Thank you very much for this nice overview of the very confusing situation in Herbert Smithite. Um, now, I have a question um, about um, the defects in the plane. I mean, um, basically, um, it's sort of excluded that you have zinc in the planes, right? Um, but now you um, told us that uh, Bernard Bernou needs 11% um, defects um, in the plane for, uh, for the simulation. So what, what is this? Is this? Is this, after all, missing spins, or is it modified um, interactions in the plane? No, uh, what uh, Bernard Bernou and Laura incorporated in their series is just a dilution. They take out sites, okay? So this is what they call effective dilution. So it's not, you know, it's not acceptable to have this 11%, because the maximum would be 5%, you know, if, if you would say all the, all the cappers uh, which go on, uh, uh, on the zinc side come from uh, the Kagome cappers. So it's unrealistic numbers, uh, but it's the way to say that there is a perturbation in the Kagome planes. And just what they did is putting uh, a scenario where you have dilution. But you should not take this 11% or 15% seriously. What, what, what one should do is calculate the series once you know the j -perp, have, uh, have uh, the coupled Kagome bilayers and make a series of this. Basically, they are working on this. So, so would it, for example, be possible to have a very strong coupling to an inter, in, interstitial um, zinc, uh, which would basically form a singlet and take out a spin? Is that a possibility? Yeah, it could be. It could be. There is no reason why J perp is uh, so small. Yeah, and, and we have to come back. You know, we were, everyone was very happy at the beginning that Herbert Smith site has decoupled planes because this copper 2 plus was quasi-free. But this scenario is, uh, I think, is over. That's my personal view. There is no way out. More complicated, sorry. Uh, it's, uh, Any other we don't question? have the ideal one, so we work with what we have. Any other question from the audience? Uh, hello, it's an online question. Go ahead, please. Uh, so about the low field, uh, specific heat fitting for the Dirac spin liquid scenario. Uh, I was wondering if the ratio of the linear part and the quadratic part also matched with theory. A quadratic uh, specific heat? Yeah, and you, yeah, in the well, low. Uh, no, from a, well, from the experimental point of view, I showed it's 1.5, T1, T to the 1.5. Of course, in the restricted T range and for high fields, and which is consistent when you add the short key anomaly, right, uh, down to zero field. And uh, from the series, it's absolutely, there is absolutely no way out. Uh, you, it's, it, it's, it's not T squared. It doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. No, for the, when you did the Dirac spin liquid fitting, right, of the specific heat in the middle of the top. Sorry, I, I don't catch your question. In the middle of the top, you showed a fitting of the specific heat yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, we use the series to fit the susceptibility from our uh, shift measurements. And there you, you have to make assumption about uh, what could be uh, the specific heat. And uh, uh, it could not be gapped, that they don't work. So we tried T, T squared, because these are the main scenarios. Right. And uh, uh, the jury is out, uh, you know, to fit, uh, to fit our shift. Both, uh -huh. uh, both work. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, so it's T1 uh, to the 1.5. So if we would put T to the 1.5, it would work as well. You know, it would, but the ratio of the T com contribution and the T square contribution is also fixed by theory. That's, that was my Lattice point. contribution, you mean? Uh, if, uh, uh, if the lattice contribution is negligible at these uh, temperatures where we put. Okay, thank you. See any more raised hands? So uh, I presume that this is. Uh, the end uh, of this talk then i don't see any more questions from the audience also so let's thanks phillips for a very nice talk thank you and uh, let's move on to the second talk of this session which will be given online